It is June 22nd, 2020, and 75 years ago today, the nearly three-month-long Battle of Okinawa was drawing to a close after organized Japanese resistance had collapsed the day before. Just four days earlier, on the 18th, Lieutenant General Simon Bolivar Buckner Jr., commander of the U.S. 10th Army, had been killed by Japanese artillery, the highest-ranking officer of the United States military to be killed as a result of enemy fire in the Second World War. The Battle of Okinawa was the largest and deadliest of the Pacific Campaign. It was extraordinary and tragic in many ways, but it's largely thought of as a land battle. By that point in the war, the Japanese Navy had been nearly decimated. Their only brief attempt to try to intervene in this battle was destroyed long before it came within sight of a, an enemy ship. And yet, in all the annals of valor that we take from the Battle of Okinawa, one fact seems to slip through that the United States Navy took more casualties in the Battle of Okinawa than either the Army or the Marines. In fact, by some measures, the Battle of Okinawa was the deadliest battle in the history of the United States Navy. The Naval Battle of Okinawa deserves to be remembered. At 463 square miles, the island of Okinawa is the largest of the Okinawa Islands of the Ryukyu Chain. It's considered one of the five main islands of Japan, although it is the smallest and least populated of those. The Ryukyu chain lies between Japan and Taiwan, and Okinawa is some 400 miles south of the main island of Kyushu, and 300 miles north of Taiwan. In 1945, the estimated population of the island was approximately 300,000. Okinawa was the final step in the Allied island hopping campaign in the Pacific. Okinawa's airfields and anchorage would be the staging area for what was expected to be the climactic showdown of the war. Operation Downfall, the Allied invasion of the Japanese home islands. Estimates of the Japanese garrison ranged between 76 and 86,000. The garrison had been ordered to defend until the last. While there was no realistic thought that the island could be held, the idea was to draw out the battle, making it as long and deadly as possible to convince the Allies that an invasion of the home islands would come at enormous cost. Even the few in the Japanese military who had become convinced that the war was lost saw the defense as a matter of honor regardless of the cost in lives of both military personnel and civilians. Arrayed against this force were some 183,000 combat troops and nearly 500,000 total personnel of the U.S. 10th Army, a unique hybrid force comprised of four U.S. Army divisions and three divisions of the United States Marine Corps. Supporting those troops was what has been described as the most powerful naval force in history. Combat ships included 16 fleet aircraft carriers, 6 light aircraft carriers, 22 escort carriers, 20 battleships, 38 cruisers, 146 destroyers, and 45 destroyer escorts, as well as hundreds of amphibious assault and support vessels. Given the state of the Imperial Japanese Navy, the force was almost ridiculous in size and could produce so much firepower that the battle itself became known as the Typhoon of Steel. But the greatest risk to the fleet protecting the 500,000 men of the invasion force was not the ships of the Japanese Navy, but the divine wind, the suicide attacks of the Japanese, kamikaze. Okinawa was within range of land-based planes from both the home islands and Taiwan, and the Japanese would launch nearly 1,500 planes bent on self-destruction, their contribution to the Typhoon of Steel. The risk was well recognized by the Allies, and the Armada included a British task force with five British fleet carriers. Unlike the American fleet carriers, the British fleet carriers had armored decks, which gave them room for fewer aircraft, but protected them from the damage of the kamikaze planes. The British force included ships of the navies of Australia, Canada, and New Zealand. The invasion of the main island was scheduled for April 1st, but the navy was taking casualties long before that. On March 19th, the Essex-class carrier USS Franklin, nicknamed the Big Ben, was sent within 50 miles of the Japanese home islands, closer than any other U.S. carrier came during the war. The purpose was an attack on the remnants of the Japanese fleet in preparation for the invasion of Okinawa. After the raid, a Japanese dive bomber managed to follow the attacking planes back to the carrier. The plane dropped from the clouds before the anti-aircraft guns could respond, striking the carrier with two 550-pound bombs. The carrier was preparing for another strike at the time, and the explosion started to ignite fuel and ordnance on the planes on the flight deck and in the hangar deck, followed by ammunition from the ship's guns and the ready lockers. In all, Franklin suffered 126 secondary explosions. Despite fires and catastrophic damage, heroic efforts on the part of her crew and the ships assisting her saved the stricken ship in what has been described as one of the most epic feats of damage control in naval history, earning Big Ben a second nickname, the ship that wouldn't die. 
By morning, Franklin was under her own power again. Franklin had taken more casualties than any ship in U.S. naval history that survived. For the heroic effort to save the ship, members of Franklin's ship company and air group would ultimately be awarded two medals of honor, 19 Navy crosses, 22 silver stars, 116 bronze stars, and 235 letters of commendation. One of the medals of honor went to Lieutenant Commander Joseph Timothy O'Callaghan, a Jesuit priest and ship's chaplain, who despite wounds from explosions, not only ministered to the wounded and conducted last rites for the dying, but also organized firefighting and rescue crews and helped to jettison or hose down munitions at risk of explosion. He was the first chaplain in U.S. Navy history to be awarded the nation's highest award for valor. But the Franklin was only the beginning. The destroyer USS Halligan was sunk by a mine on March 26th, and the minesweeper USS Skylark was sunk by mines on the 28th. Other ships, including the battleship Nevada, the heavy cruiser Indianapolis, and the destroyers O'Brien and Halsey Powell were severely damaged by kamikaze attacks. And the invasion hadn't even yet begun. Opposition was surprisingly light when soldiers of the U.S. 23rd Army Corps and Marines of the 3rd Amphibious Corps hit the beaches on April 1st. The Japanese commander, Lieutenant General Mitsuro Ushijima, had realized that beach defenses would likely be destroyed in the pre-invasion bombardment and had prepared a defensive line to trap the Americans. It was a deadly trap and the battle would be fought ridge to ridge, a great cost on both sides. At sea, the Navy continued to take losses from sporadic air attacks. The fleet lost destroyers, landing ships, and attack transports. The escort carrier USS Wake Island had a 16 foot by 45 foot hole blown in her below the waterline by a kamikaze that nearly missed the ship but exploded next to her. The Nevada was hit again, disabling her number two turret. But this was all just a prelude. The Japanese had amassed a massive number of planes in southern Japan and Taiwan. On April 6th, the Japanese launched their first massive kamikaze attack called Kukushi, or Floating Chrysanthemum. Between April 6th and 7th, 355 planes came in swarm suicide attacks on the fleet. The attacks often fell hardest on the ships of the radar picket, destroyer and destroyer escorts, manning the outer ring of defenses, there to warn the fleet of incoming attacks. The inexperienced Japanese pilots often attacked the first ship they saw, and the destroyers and escorts were less able to withstand the attacks. The effects were devastating. Despite concentrated anti-aircraft fire and fighter cover, the kamikazes came in such numbers that some inevitably slipped through. A flight of between 40 and 50 planes attacked the destroyers Bush and Kassen Young. Bush was struck amidships, and the destroyer Calhoun came to its rescue, but was itself hit when another 15 planes attacked. More planes struck as the crews desperately worked to save their ships, but in the end, both destroyers were lost. The Cassin Young picked up survivors. Cassin Young would later be damaged twice by kamikazes in May. The destroyers Newcomb, Lutz, Morris, and Bennett, destroyer minesweepers Rodman and Emmons, destroyer escort Witter and battleship USS Maryland were all damaged badly enough that they would be out of action for the rest of the war. Several other ships received damage and casualties. On the 7th, the Japanese Navy made its only sortie of the battle, a desperate attempt to bring the super battleship Yamato into the fray. The ships were discovered almost immediately by U.S. submarines, and the attack was repulsed by an air attack. The Yamato, the largest battleship ever built, was swarmed by multiple waves of aircraft and took hits from at least a dozen torpedoes and several bombs before her forward magazine exploded. The great ship sank without getting within 200 miles of the Battle of Okinawa. But the kamikazes had done what the ships of the Japanese Navy could not. As the battle ground on on land, the floating chrysanthemums continued. On April 16th, the destroyer USS Laffey came under an 80-minute attack by 22 planes. Despite shooting down at least eight aircraft, Laffey was hit by four bombs and six kamikaze crashes. Her surface search and air search radars were put out of action. Her aft 5-inch turret and one of her quad 40mm batteries were destroyed. She was going down by the stern due to a bomb hit, and her rudder was jammed 26 degrees over, with virtually everything after the aft stack engulfed in aviation gasoline fires. But when an officer suggested that they might have to abandon ship, her captain, Commander Frederick Beckton, said, I'll never abandon ship as long as a single gun will fire. Astoundingly, the crew managed to get the damage under control and save the ship which survived for post-war service and is now preserved as a floating museum in South Carolina. The destroyer minesweeper USS Aaron Ward and destroyer USS Little came under a similar mass attack on May 3rd. Low clouds gave the attackers cover, limiting the ability to defend with anti-aircraft fire. Little took four kamikaze hits in four minutes, with the engine from the last plane ripping through the ship and exploding her boilers, breaking her keel. She sank in just 12 minutes, with a loss of 31 crew killed. Despite being hit several times, a Fleming Kamikaze struck the Aaron Ward, starting an aviation fuel fire, jamming her rudder and reducing her speed. 
Another attacker hit her stack, while another dropped a bomb that exploded close enough to disable her engine, leaving her dead in the water. A sitting duck, allowing two more kamikazes to strike. Despite the loss of 42 crew and extensive damage and fires, as night fell the crew managed to get the fires under control, and she was taken under tow. Of her exceptional damage control effort, Commander-in-Chief of the Pacific Area Fleet Admiral Chester Nimitz later said, We all admire a ship that can't be licked. Another wave of 150 planes attacked on May 11th. Despite an air battle with U.S. planes, several made it through, attacking the destroyers Hugh W. Hadley and Evans. Despite multiple hits, both ships survived. Downing 23 enemy aircraft, the Hugh W. Hadley earned the record for the most enemy aircraft downed in a single engagement, earning the vessel a presidential unit citation. But the swarms were not the only risk. The same day the Hugh W. Hadley and Evans were attacked, a handful of planes snuck through the radar screen and targeted the fleet carrier USS Bunker Hill. The first dropped its bomb onto the flight deck before plowing into a group of armed and fueled aircraft awaiting takeoff. The second struck within a minute, dropping a bomb that crashed through the hangar deck while the plane struck just short of the island. A third plane came quickly but was shot down by anti-aircraft fire. Like the Franklin, the Bunker Hill was rocked by secondary explosions and aviation fuel fires. The first bomb had exploded outside the pilot's ready room, killing several pilots and crew, while many more died on the flight deck. A young torpedo bomber tail gunner named Paul L. Newman likely would have been in that area where many men of his squadron died. But his pilot had come down with an earache before the crew was supposed to relocate to the Bunker Hill, and so he missed the battle. After the war, he went on to star in motion pictures, like The Hustler and Cool Hand Luke. In all, 93 crew of the Bunker Hill died in the explosions, fires, and efforts to save the ship. The ship was saved, but the war was over before repairs could be finished. The kamikaze attacks continued, even as the troops on the ground slowly took the enemy's fortified positions. The destroyer William D. Porter, famous for having accidentally fired a torpedo at the USS Iowa while President Roosevelt was on board, was sunk by a kamikaze on June 10th. The plane missed, but its bomb exploded in the water and broke the destroyer's keel. The destroyer USS Twig was sunk on June 16th. The kamikaze torpedo bomber had hit it with its torpedo before crashing into the ship, exploding her magazine. The last mass attack of 45 planes started on June 21st. The seaplane tender USS Curtis was heavily damaged, killing 24 of her crew, but stayed afloat. Her perhaps most famous crew member, Lieutenant Henry Fonda, had been reassigned to a position on land before the battle, and so missed the attack. A landing ship medium was sunk, and other ships, including the destroyer escort USS Halloran, were damaged. The same day, Lieutenant General Ushijima committed seppuku, and the last organized resistance on the island came to an end. The battle on the island was declared over on June 22nd, but the kamikazes were not done. A landing ship tank, LST-534, was struck by a kamikaze and sunk. The 82-day battle of Okinawa came at a terrible cost. Virtually the entire Japanese garrison was annihilated, as well as an estimated one-third to one-half of the island's civilian population, many of whom committed suicide. The U.S. suffered more than 12,000 killed in action, with the Navy losses, 4,907 killed, exceeding those of the Army or the Marines. Depending upon the measure, it was the deadliest battle in the 244-year history of the United States Navy. Because of the nature of kamikaze damage, the Navy's number killed exceeded the number wounded, and many of those wounded suffered burns from the aviation fuel fires. A stunning 368 Allied ships were damaged, and 36 sunk. Despite losing the island and their own terrible losses, the Japanese defenders of Okinawa made their point. Many historians argue that it was the losses in the Battle of Okinawa that convinced the Americans to use atomic bombs on Japan as an alternative to the terrible casualties they thought they would have taken if they were forced to invade the Japanese home islands. The impact that the Battle of Okinawa had on the end of the war is still a matter of discussion among historians. There's not a lot of discussion of a naval battle of Okinawa, with the exception of the failed attack on April 7th, the Japanese Navy played hardly a role at all in the battle. And yet, in the Battle of Okinawa, the U.S. Navy faced challenges on a scale they had never seen before. The thousands of acts of bravery to save ships that had taken terrible damage, braving the fire and smoke to rescue comrades, to fight the fires, to stay at your guns, to defend your ship, marked the Battle of Okinawa as perhaps the U.S. Navy's finest hour. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the History Guy, short snippets of forgotten history between 10 and 15 minutes long. And if you did enjoy, please go ahead and click that thumbs up button. 
If you have any questions or comments or suggestions for future episodes, please write those in the comment section and I will be happy to personally respond. Be sure to follow The History Guy on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and check out our merchandise on teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes on Forgotten History, all you need to do is subscribe.